Welcome to Night Shadows. I'm Stuart Best. Where the paranormal is normal. Where that which you thought you knew, you didn't. And where the future can be known, if you know exactly where to look. Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks for tuning in and listening. And we have uh, our guest, Barry Rothman, with us, a Bible code expert. And some of the things he's found are, I think, rather astounding and kind of confirm uh, a lot of what Bible prophets had to say in Jeremiah and Isaiah and places like that, Daniel. Um, Anyway, it it should be a very interesting hour, and we also have uh, Larry with us on his mountaintop. Hi, uh, Barry. How are you doing? Pretty good. How are you tonight? I'm doing fine. And Larry, how are you? Hi, Larry. All <laughs> oh, ready to hear what Barry has to say, of course. Yeah. Why don't we uh, start with this uh, Bible code thing that uh, Barry came up with on uh, the wall and Obama, et cetera, et cetera. To me, that's the most fascinating uh thing along well of course his uh stuff on time uh was a, a really big uh thing to me but uh, Barry you wanna lead us into this uh, uh, Civil War, Barack Obama, President Michelle, uh Schumer, et cetera, et cetera. What's your take on all that? And we can go through all the words and and anyway, um just help us out. Okay, I'd be happy to do that. First of all, I want to make uh, clear something to your, your guests, uh, I mean your audience out there tonight, um, and that is that we have a silent partner who is listening in and who uh, I detected on my site uh, a little over an hour ago, but I, they're probably still on there right now, and that is the uh, Army Intelligence Base at Fort Huachuca in Arizona. And they follow everything extremely closely. I put a new uh, matrix up today. And within one minute, they're there. In fact, they basically, from what I can see, can control what the host is doing that I use. So that's one mm-hmm. thing. The other thing I'd like to say is I'd like to point out uh, a verse uh, in Deuteronomy. It's chapter 30, verses 19. And it says, um, I, I, this day I call the heavens and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, Blessings and curses. Now choose life that uh, you and your children may live. And the reason that I want to have this as as kind of the preamble for what's going to go on tonight is that um, a lot of these things that I look for have to do with the fate of people. And it's one thing to look and see is somebody's fate there. It's another to publish it because when you do, There's always the possibility, and you have to be very careful about this, that somebody may try to fulfill prophecy. They think they're doing a great (laughs) deed or whatever. And so if I look at what's likely to happen or what may happen or I find a matrix, you know, uh, I don't want that used as cause for action, uh, especially if it's, uh, you know, a negative action uh, against anybody. So we have to be very (laughs) careful about this. you also have to be, uh, realize that when it comes to uh, what looks like a prophecy, that I'm looking up certain words. So, for instance, on this uh, one, the first one we're going to talk about is the Civil War. Um, I looked up uh, the, the politicians that are dividing our country right now, but I have not had the chance yet to look up, for instance, Abraham Lincoln and see whether or not all the generals that were involved in the last Civil War are there. Um, they may very well be, but in this particular case, I went looking for something which I would either find or not find. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, the whole ball game. There could be a negative statement in there someplace that I haven't seen that says this is not true. This is what people think is going to happen. So there's that caveat over there that we, you know, we're we're learning the rules of the game as we go along here, and we have to be careful not to step on anybody's toes although I probably step on <laughs> some Democratic <laughs> shows too often. <laughs> I'm definitely not, not a Democrat or a socialist or a communist or anything like that. You can be sure of that. Uh, I am a modern Orthodox Jew, uh, in case any of your um, audience doesn't know that. But uh, at any rate, I, 
Uh, let's let's get into the matrix, and uh, at least that I think um, serves to, to warn some people about some of the dangers here. So this uh, research started, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago, and like so many people in the country, I'm so disturbed at the division that I see in the United States right now. Um, mm-hmm. I'm a modern Orthodox Jew. I have a cousin who's a conservative Jew, and I'm or I'm a definite. I'm sorry. He's he's when I say conservative Jew, doesn't mean he's conservative politically. It's the conservative wing of the Jewish religion, which is actually liberal, yes. very liberal. <laughs> okay, and I'm very conservative. So we often have very heated political discussions, and when we do, you know, we have both pretty much reached a conclusion that it looks like the country's heading towards a civil war. Now, I love this guy, my cousin, uh, dearly. He taught me how to ride a bike when I was a kid and how to play chess and so many other things. And um, we've grown, we're grown old together, but nonetheless, politically, we're we've absolutely grown in opposite directions, and we don't see how a civil war is going to be avoided, but I hope it can be. So the the first verse that I read tonight, the blessing and the curse, life and death, choose yes. life. When I talk about things like what I'm going to talk about, there are certain negative things I've found. I've also found a bomb encoded with atomic holocaust. Uh, we hope that that's going to be avoided. Uh, but there's a choice that the Torah gives us in terms of our actions, and that's in the open text, and that's what I just read. So, in other words, it's uh, it's like uh, the forbidden fruit in a sense. You know, you have a cho- Adam and Eve had a choice. You can eat it. You cannot eat it. But if you eat it, there's going to be certain consequences. But still, there was a choice there. So it kind of represents free will to a certain mm-hmm. extent. And we have choices to make. We have choices to make in particular. I'm going to say that Fort Huachuca has choices to make. And I've seen a little bit of negativity from them, and then I've seen them sit back and just learn you know, uh, what's what the code is all about. But, you know, they've also given me some hints that indicated where the government might, might like to go with this. So they have a choice. Uh, we have our politicians have choices. And uh, I, I did hear tonight that there may be some solution coming on the wall where uh, the president would settle for $1.6 billion instead of the $5 billion he was looking for for Congress, but then he was going to turn around and take the rest of the money from the military budget and slide it over to get his $5 billion up front, you know, to start construction yes. of about 65 miles worth of, of wall. So there's a choice there. And um, we want to make sure that people make intelligent choices. All right, having said all of that, okay, what, do we, what did I look for? I looked for civil war in the codes, and I've looked for it before because of the many people besides my cousin uh, that have said, even on, on television, uh, that, we're, hey, it looks like we're heading towards a civil war. But I could never find it before, and I couldn't find it because I was looking for it as one continuous term at an equidistant letter sequence. So what were an ELS? What is an ELS? Let me explain that briefly for anybody who hasn't heard this before. The Torah has 304,805 letters in it, the Torah being the books of... uh, uh, Genesis, Exodus, uh, Numbers, Le- uh, Levit- Leviticus, rather, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those five, first five books of the Bible, that's, that's the Torah. And the tradition is there's a, a code in it, and it has the entire future of the world in it. And it's based on uh, equal, equidistant letters uh, or, or a number of letters between each letter. So, in other words, I find the word civil at a skip of minus 32,432. So that means that from the first letter of civil to the second, it's 32,432 letters. To the third, another 32,432 letters, and so forth, to the fourth and the fifth and the sixth letter. <laughs> when the computer finds a word like that that has an e, that's at an ELS, it goes vertical. And unless you take some other actions, there's going to be no spaces between each letter vertically. So it looks like only one letter apart going vertically, but it's really every line that the computer sees has 32,000, in this case, 432 letters. Another word, you know, another subject would have a different skip. But the Mm -hmm. computer finds these things. Now, what I did was different this time, knowing that I could not find civil and war in sequence, was to say, okay, I'm going to look for a small box, let's say 50 letters, and it must have civil as the first word, and it must have war in the open text. And war in Hebrew is uh, machama. 
so I'm going looking for that, and I know how many times uh, you know, civil war um, or war occurs in the Torah. And um, let me just go back there for a second. Uh, so, I, so at any rate, I find that. So the minimum number of letters uh, uh, that you can uh, hold on a second. I got I, well, something just came off the screen here. Okay, get it back over here. Okay, the minimum number of letters that you can put civil and war together is 30. So that's six rows by five columns because Malchama in Hebrew is five letters. So you get, you know, mm-hmm. rows by columns, six times five is 30. In this particular case, what I have over here is um, 42 letters. So it's two columns off, but the whole statement that goes through uh, through civil is um, army or service of the war. So, in other words, while the word war is two, it is two columns off, the whole phrase, army of the war, is going through civil. So you, if you wanted to start reading the other way, you would have uh, army of the war, what war is it, the next one, then you would look vertically and you would see civil. So it's, it's, a, good, it's a good expression. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's small enough that I think it's, it's worth looking for. Now, normally, when I pick an axis term, I want to be at, I'd like, prefer it to be at the lowest skip possible, the smallest number of letters between each letter of the word. Uh, yes. In this case, I didn't get that. It was a rather high skip. In this case, for civil, it was at, a skip, it was at ELS rank 169, which means I had 168 chances before I got to this one you know, to find one that, that matched the way I wanted to match. So, therefore, what I wind up doing in the end is saying, okay, this is ELS rank 169, therefore I'll divide the final probability I have, I'll decrease its value by a factor of 169 because I had the 168 other chances, now the 169th chance to find the thing. So now, at that point, uh, I'm treating this, uh, normally civil and war as, as uh, one term, in this case because it's separated a little bit. Um, you know, I'm basically going to divide it by 169. I'm going to treat it um, uh, a little bit different than a normal axis term. But at any rate, I go looking for the major things. So the first word that I want to look for is wall, because the wall uh, that the president wants to build is the, is the source of t- such tension. Uh, we're looking at uh, just a few days away, Friday, uh, the president wants to shut down the government, or well, at least part of the government. It's going to we've got about seventy percent funded, so he's going to shut it down if he doesn't have the funding over the wall. He says, so that's going to make for a lot of hard feelings for a lot of people. The Democrats could avoid it easily by giving him what he wants for the funding for the wall, and but they don't want to do that because yeah, it's a victory they're handing to him. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's one thing. Now we we have statements by. Uh, President uh, President Trump, and he's aware that people, are, you know, there's obviously going to be a tremendous effort to impeach him, you know, with the uh, Democrats taking over the House of Representatives. I think the American people made a huge mistake in putting the Democrats in office. Not to say the Republicans are perfect. There's a lot of things that they, they've got to improve on. But what they've done is open up a can of worms where there may not be much that the Democrats are doing at all but trying to take the president down, and he yep. likes to fight. Yep. So, uh, therefore, the the uh, emphasis is going to shift from fixing our country to wrecking it at the cause. You know, with Democrats want to wreck it just so they can bring down the president. And uh, so Trump said, I, I'm looking at the New York Post, people would revolt if he were impeached. Well, what's a revolt by the people? That's a civil war or a revolution or whatever. Uh, and then we have on the uh, on this figure one I have here we have the statement by President Barack Obama, uh, and he made this statement in South Africa five months ago. He said, "Rabid nationalism and racist ideology lead to civil war." Now, of course, President Trump has said he's proud to be a nationalist. So this remark by yes. Obama is uh, who is the most racist person I've met in my entire life short of some Nazis. I mean, the hatred this man has for whites and for Jews is unbelievable. I yes. read his book, Dreams from My Father, and it was all, you know, uh, whitey and, and just the trash honkies and everything else, bad language against the Jews. 
We also discusses in there what looks like there's a confession that he was born in Kenya, but that's another matter. But at any rate, when he visited Kenya, he was pretty much told as much by um, his uh, half-sister. But here, you know, this was delivered in South Africa, this, these remarks. But, you know, he's talking about civil war. The president is talking about uh, revolting if people try to uh, impeach him. So the first guy to look for, the man that I think if we have a civil war is absolutely responsible, it would be President Barack Obama. And there is only one Sintora uh, in the 304,805 letters that B. Obama occurs at a skip of uh, plus or minus one. It's a minus one. And that uh, one time is Genesis. It's chapter 24, verse 62. And it's letters uh, 7 through 12 in the, in the verse there, but going backwards, so from 12 back to 7. So B. Obama is on this little matrix I'm looking at. The whole size of the matrix is nine rows by 26 columns. It's 234 letters. So, you know, that's a certain uh, fraction of the Torah. We can do a mathematical calculation, and we can find out what's the probability of uh, having B. Obama in that area. And um, the answer is, if it were the first time it appeared, uh, or no, this was sorry, if this was ba- this matrix was based on the only time in Torah uh, that uh, civil was there, the axis term is there. The odds against finding B. Obama would be 1,303 uh, against, so 1,303 against, and yet it's here, but it's not. You know, so we have to we have to look at all the items that are in the matrix and then divide it by 169. But he is the most significant term in the matrix. So at first I was satisfied to see him in terms of what I expected. Not, not I'm not happy to see that he's, you know, possibly the cause yeah, of the civil right. war or a nuclear <laughs> war or anything else. But in terms of doing my research, that's, that's, a, that's an initial bingo. All right, so then what else can I find? All right, um, I, looked, I looked for Schumer. Uh, he is on the matrix and he shares a letter with Civil, but he's not at what I call a special case skip, which is plus or minus one, or the skip of the axis term, in this case, Michelle. Those are the special case skips that I like to look for. So uh, although I've got Schumer here, he had a 39% chance to be on the matrix at a non-special case skip. So I'm not too thrilled at that point. Um, I look for a president. Uh, it occurs 68 times in Torah at skip one. It's also the same word as prince uh, or chief, but uh, it's here, but it's not at skip uh, plus one. It's not in the open text. And so that's not uh, too surprising. I had one chance and had about, had about 32% chance to be on the matrix. So then what? Uh, then I look at, okay, I start thinking, well, who, who else is involved in this thing? And I start thinking, well, who is who are the leading Democratic candidates for president, uh, you know, for the 2020 election? And I have a list of them here, and I heard a similar list on TV tonight. And uh, number one uh, is on this one was Kamala Harris, but she only had uh, odds against, uh, this is what, odds to win the presidency. Trump was plus 150, Kamala Harris was plus 1,000. Uh, of course, Trump is going to get the, the Republican nomination. Then it went Betty O'Rourke, uh, no, Beto O'Rourke. He was uh, higher tonight on the polls I heard on TV. Bernie Sanders uh, was next, was 1,200. Uh, Joe Biden was up there. I think Biden was number one on TV tonight. Bernie Sanders was number two. And then uh, we, start, we start going down the list. We get to, All of a sudden, we get to what I think is the way the Democrats think, an ideal candidate. She's black. She's a woman. And, you know, there are other other issues that we may discuss later in terms of just how far to the left she is. She's a pretty good speaker. She's got, you know, high opinions uh, by most people in the country uh, of her. And she seems like uh, she's filling the bill in terms of a number of things uh, the Democrats like. Odds said uh, there, the betting odds were uh, instead of the leader had plus 1,000, she's at plus 3,300. But surprisingly, you know, if I go all the way down the list, uh, and I have all these listed on this article about um, about the Civil War ahead, 
I find that uh, if I compare her plus 3,300 with Hillary Clinton, who wants to run again, apparently, she's Clinton's at plus 6,600. So what does that mean? That means that Michelle Obama is twice as likely if these odds, these are like Las Vegas betting odds. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's, she's, twi- uh, she's twice as likely as Hillary Clinton is to get another shot at it. You know, um, so that makes it of interest. So at that point, I said, well, let me see if Michelle is there. And, you know, in Hebrew, her name is uh, spelled Mem Yud Shin Lamed. It's only four letters, but the second letter of her name, Yud, share is, is sharing, is being shared with Sybil. And her name appears at skip one going through Sybil. So, in other words, here this person I'm specifically looking for the name of, there couldn't be a closer match. At the better, when there couldn't be a better skip. Always with me, plus one is the best skip. Then I like to see either minus one or the skip of the axis term, plus or plus or minus. Uh, you know, the absolute absolute skip of the axis term. But plus one, I consider best case scenario. So I can do a little calculation, and I find the odds against Michelle Obama being at skip plus one on the whole 234 letter matrix is about 217 to one. But actually, the odds that she's going to uh, cross the axis term and um, and share a letter with <laughs> with it like that is a couple thousand to one. It's like uh, two thousand one hundred or so, something like that to one against. So when I see that, I got to match that extraordinary. Then I, I really sit up and I take notice that hey, there you know this this seems to be warning us that both the president former president Obama and his wife, they're at the core of what could be a civil war. Now, later in this article, I I do a little bit of a literary review uh, of a book by Stephen Kuntz called Liberty's Last Stand. And it's a fiction work. It was published in 2016, the year of the last election. Uh, The Democratic candidate for president was uh, Hinton instead of Clinton. You know, but the president of the United States was a guy who's named in the book as being Barry Satoro. And I hope everybody in your in your audience knows who Barry Satoro is. That, of course, was President Obama's name when he lived in uh, Indonesia. His father was uh, not his father. His uh, stepfather was a Satoro. And so uh, Barack Obama used the name Barry Satoro in Indonesia where he was registered in school as being a Muslim. Also had an Indonesian passport, which is very interesting, because in order to get an Indonesian passport, you have to, uh, if you're an American, you have to renounce your U.S. citizenship. They won't allow for dual citizenship over there. So at some, uh, at some point, I guess it would have been his mother, would have renounced her, his citizenship to get him the Indonesian passport, which he later traveled to Pakistan with. You know, he's got a fascinating uh, identity. But at any rate, in, in this book, Liberty's Last Stand, the book is about um, a situation where the president um, purposely allows terrorists to succeed in this country, Muslim terrorists, with the idea of, um, of putting the country under martial law. And then he wants to, uh, in, in the book, he, he wanted to put off the uh, elections to, because of uh, civil disobedience or threats or whatever. And there's riots against it when he does this, and there's a civil war that ensues. So that's what Liberty's Last Stand is about. It's about a civil war based on President uh, Obama. And uh, one of the more exciting books that I've read in a long time, uh, I was amazed that uh, – uh, in fact, that they allowed for the publication of this book because uh, it, it doesn't pull any punches, <laughs> you know. And, and yet, Stephen Koontz is a p- pretty big writer. He, I mean, he's a, he's a great writer. But uh, this is probably where he went on the limb, out on the limb. And, and to a certain extent, I am tonight talking about some of this stuff. But I want to remind everybody, especially Fort Huachuca, that when I use the code. I'm just looking to see what's there, and if there's nothing there, I'll say there's nothing there. And if there is, then I put out the necessary caveats. Uh, I don't like to talk about negative things, and uh, there's always a possibility that we can prevent this. But we have to at least know what the risks are. 
you know, mm-hmm. in order to prevent it. And, um, you know, it would have been nice if uh, people maybe made some better choices in the election um, where we, yeah. we lost the House recently. But now that, that in, in losing the House and, and now bringing this situation to a near head where there's probably going to be an attempt to impeach the president, which is going to be the most divisive thing possible uh, for this country, I mean, a lot of people just will not stand having the election stolen from you know uh, from them, you know, uh, especially for some of this nonsense out there like the Russian collusion that would, never exists. There's no evidence for it, whatever. Right. So anyway, this whole matrix. Uh, when I divided the, the combined odds, let me see if there's anything else on here that I want to talk about. Uh, I prefer if I pretty much hit the terms. The small matrix, but the odds against it after I divide by the 169. The odds against it were 6,520,453 to 1. So normally I just publish my matrices, and then I sit back and I look at, you know, well, who's reading it? And there's a little trick where I can tell who's Defense Department, usually. And I can always, and if Fort Huachuca um, ensures you know, with their with their methods that I see them immediately as soon as as soon as they come on. Uh, you know, I I I know they're here right away. And uh in fact I actually have massive records of uh how often they've come here and when they've come, depending on what I've written and so forth. You know, in case there's ever any legal problems I can show exactly what I wrote about, when I wrote about it, when they came there and who else came there as a result of that. The regular readers, uh the people listening in on the phone right now if they're they're not they're not spies or anything. They don't have to worry about me me doing. I don't keep records for everybody else, but I do look for I do look for, I do look for these guys, especially because I got threatened once by uh, somebody who uh, was associated with Fort Huachuca, and I think I've discussed that on a, on a show with you before. Yes, you did. So yep. now there is a second matrix uh, that I have on here. And uh, Larry, I want to thank you for uh, putting up this uh, matrix with um, with Black Power and being the same B. Obama. Uh, since you put it up, I went and looked, and, uh, and I was curious: was Michelle Obama, uh, Michelle there also? And the answer is that yes, she is. I had to expand the matrix from 84 letters to show Black Power as the axis term, and uh, B. Obama at skip minus one. But that gave me, and when I went from 84 letters up to 266, it gave me Michelle at skip one. And before the odds against the matrix were like, uh, well, I think it was 100 and, no, I think it was about 100 and something to one. Uh, But when I did this, uh, the odds went up to, uh, odds against it went up to 16,885 to one. So it was definitely worth a slight expansion to show Michelle. And uh, then I looked at at what I had, and it took me a while to think about this. I knew automatically it was the same B. Obama because there's only once it occurs that it's get plus or or minus one, minus one in Torah. So every time I see that, and I always look for that because I I like that term because normally um, you're not going to find B. Obama vertically at the same skip. You may find Obama, but you won't find B. Obama. You know, uh, the six letters mm-hmm. required for that. So, therefore, this is this makes it immediately significant if I find it. So it's just something I keep in mind. If I'm looking for Obama, okay, look to see is he at the skip of the axis term and look to see is he at skip minus one. Uh, and, you know, if it's, it's, uh, there's, no, there's no Obama by itself, just as minus one. It's always be Obama over there. And it always comes from the same exact point, which is Genesis chapter four, uh, 24, verse 62, as I mentioned before. But now I figured, after I found this, I said, you know, I'm just curious. I know that Michelle occurs six times in Torah. Is this the same Michelle? And sure enough, when I compared the Axis term with the Civil War with Black Power, <clears throat> Michelle in both cases is found at Exodus chapter 22, verse 13. Uh, verses 40 to, I'm sorry, letters 40 to 43. So it is exactly the same B. Obama and Michelle uh, on both matrices. And wow. when you think about black power and what they're saying, and you think about civil war, um, there were a lot of times during the Obama administration where there would be, unfortunately, a police officer might shoot a, uh, a black 
a young black person or mm-hmm. something like that, and there would be riots. And in some yeah. cases, the, the the police officer was just defending himself, and you know the kid was a threat uh, to the police police officer's life. Um, but there were constant riots of which the media seemed to love it, especially uh, CNN and MSNBC. They'd be there. They'd be waiting for the next riot. You know, I mean, they, they'd be thrilled if the city would burn down because it was a great story. Uh, that's what they were like. But um, it, it looked like, darn, it looked like almost a civil war while he was here with all the rioting that was going on. So, um, you know, black power was at the heart of it. Uh, you remember in the... Uh, in the Democratic primaries, you know, each of the candidates was asked about the, the, the phrase um, "Black Lives Matter," and yes. um, I remember the governor of Maryland. Uh, you know, he, he he started to give his 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 thoughts that oh, he thought all lives matter. He was booed. He was put down. You know, yeah. and every candidate after that who wanted to say all lives matter, which is simple common sense, no, they were told no, it's Black Lives Matter. Police don't matter. White lives don't matter. And this was a very, very pronounced, repeated pattern throughout the entire election. And if, you know, and if that's not something that's pushing pe- people towards civil war, I don't know what is. But we've never heard the mm-hmm. president come up and say, we never heard President Obama say, all lives matter. But, you know, he was really fast to talk about how, how much, uh, you know, if somebody got killed, it would remind him of his own son, uh, what, if he had a son. And so forth. He just looked like him, and it was just there was just no attempt for unity whatsoever. So to see him on these matrices like this, and I'm looking at one picture on it. It's, I've got uh, right by Michelle a picture of her with a Black Power salute, and yep. uh, the president was doing that a number of times. Um, you know, uh, it seemed to be the only thing that was on his mind back then was Black Power, and uh, you know, uh, basically it's it's, it's become almost like a crime to be a white male in this country. <laughs> you know, so uh, at least in the eyes of some of these people over there, they've got to back off, you know, because uh, they're taking us in a bad direction. And uh, so it's kind of common sense, uh, hey, reason with them. Uh, but I don't know that they can be reasoned with. As this this remains to be seen. So that's the first first part of this. Um you mentioned uh, something about um, I don't know if I want to go into the one on one uh, what Joan Rivers had to say about Michelle Obama too much, but let's just say that uh, I'm not going to explain every detail of it here. But she was insinuating that uh, that Michelle Obama was a transgender, and mm-hmm. um, in fact, uh, there's links on uh, there's a matrix that supports that. And there's links to twice where the president, uh, President Obama, was speaking, and he referred to his wife as Michael. And by the way, that Michael name uh, is repeated in that uh, book, uh, Liberty's Last Stand by Coons. I, re- I remember seeing that and falling over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he had that in there too. So uh, the rest of this article, you know. Uh, I have to take a look and and think about, well, what would a civil war like that be like? And um, without getting too specific, I do one analysis here. I have two charts I bring up at uh, Maps of the United States. One by the uh, one that shows the presidential election results for 2016 by counties. Red, of course, is Republican. Blue is Democratic. And then right next to it, U.S. population by uh, density by counties. And if you study the two maps, what you'll see is they're almost identical, except that the, you know, the denser populations are shown in orange versus the yellow population, uh, the lighter, the less dense populations mm-hmm. in light yellow instead of the red and blue type thing. But, but they, there's almost 100% correlation over here. So, if there is ever a civil war in the United States, the reason I point up this map is that, I uh, my, my job when I was in the military is to write war plans. And uh, contingency plans, disaster plans, also sometimes uh, very limited civil uh, disturbance plans. And certainly a civil war would be a massive civil disturbance. So uh, in terms of planning, how would we plan for this? Because I'm, I, I, most of my readers, they are military people. I think the vast majority of them are in, in planning. Um, I can't say that for sure. I know who Fort Huachuca is, you know, because I, I met there with the one guy. 
Uh, that's all, but it was enough to, <laughs> to, to show me what was going on. And so uh, the question, how do you plan? So uh, if there is a civil war, it's not going to be north versus south. That's the first case. Everybody knows about regions, but it's it's not even so much regional. What it would be, what it would look like, it would be the urban areas that are Democratic versus the rural areas that are Republican. And, you know, I point out in the article that if you if you had a war like that, you know, it, it it's first of all, it's hard to organize. I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to have the, the cities attack the, the farmlands and wipe out their farms? Then they got nothing to eat. Uh, I don't think you would have the farmers go into a city that's, uh, that's densely occupied with hostile forces. Uh, in right. terms of the military, I don't know that necessarily they would divide one way or the other, but I, I kind of talk about that a little bit in the article. You know, So I don't think that's what it would look like. It would not be a civil war like the last civil war. Um, the, uh, the next uh, chart I have on here, percentage of population in the United States uh, owning at least one gun in 2017 by political uh, party affiliation. And uh, I can see that the Republicans... Uh, 41% own a gun, another 15% live in a house with those guns. So that's 56% of Republicans are armed or in a household that's armed. For the Democrats, it's 16% own guns with 9% in homes where there is a gun, so it's 25%. So the Republicans, in terms of percentages, uh, are armed uh, by a ratio of 50, 56 to 25 uh, more than the Democrats, so more than twice as much many arms in Republican households, and then they show the independents over here. The independents are armed a lot more also than the, the Democrats, of course, are the least armed. But that doesn't mean that they can't do anything dangerous, because we had the, uh, what the uh, shooting there, was it, mm-hmm. um, was it Scalia? No, it was the Supreme Court. Yes. It was, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was, okay. That shooting with the baseball field. He said that they were going to get the guns. Yeah. Eventually. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, at any rate, uh, Scalia is not the Supreme Court justice over there. I'm trying to make it. Do I have the name right? I could be wrong on that. But well, uh, Scalise, are you talking about Scalise? the one that got murdered? No, he got shot and he was crippled playing baseball. Uh, oh, were, uh, it was oh a, Scalise. It was a shooter. What is it? What is it? I think it's Scalise, yeah. isn't it, Larry? Scalise. That's, Scalise. that's what I mean. Yeah. Not Scalise. 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 Yep. Scalise, Scalise it was. And, um, you know, and the guy who did it was uh, not that Bernie Sanders directed it, but he was a Bernie Sanders supporter. So you can have Democrats that are wackos out there with guns, too. Mm-hmm. You know, but that, that, but that whole thing raises the specter of whether or not the politicians become the targets. And then the question is, how does the military plan to deal with that? Uh, obviously, a lot of defense for all the politicians on both sides would be needed. Um, now, one person who really obviously is seen as extremely negative by a lot of people in this country, the Republican, <laughs> is Nancy Pelosi. And I show her uh, image right next to the Coons book, but what I have her, uh, what the quote says from the Washington Times is very interesting. It says, Pelosi tells the media, not to cover the president's criminal probes morning, noon, and night. Well, that would be a start. That's a, that's a good thing, what she said. Every once in a while, I mean, they're saving a broken clock is right twice a day. Every once in a while, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nancy yeah. Pelosi will say something that's right. Uh, whether she sticks to it too long remains to be seen. But, you know, the Democrats have been given a chance at the House of Representatives now. And obviously we've just seen where Obamacare was ruled unconstitutional and mm-hmm. the mandate is gone. So the Democrats pretty much uh, they have a chance to craft something with the Republicans they can get through. The president's anxious to sign something, you know, that's going to be uh, good health care for the country. And her focus should be on that. And the Democrats' focus should be on that. Uh, on the issue of the, of the wall. Every one of these Democrats that's opposed to the wall right now at some point uh, voted for it, including yes. President Obama, you know, uh, voted for it. So it's not that, you know, they think the wall is really what she said, what Pelosi said, immoral, because she voted for it before. 
It's just a matter of they don't want to do anything that makes Trump look good. They don't want to give him a victory on anything. And that's that's personal petty, and it's extremely yeah. divisive. And that kind of crap has got to come to an end. But, you know, here again, I come back to what I started the, the evening with. I set before you this day, you know, the blessing, life and death, the blessing and the curse. Choose life. She's got to make some choices. If she's, in fact, going to be the Speaker of the House, then she needs to let's stop all these darn probes. Because I'll tell you, they're not they're not doing a darn darn thing by now. Uh, and it's in the code that uh, Mueller is encoded. Uh, Mueller is corrupt, is encoded the same skip as Trump. You know, yes. and there's an off. The guy is an absolute crook. And yeah. uh, you know, the, all mm-hmm. these entire investigations are all nonsense. Uh, all these crimes that people are pleading to, they're I think what's called process or whatever. They said like after the fact, after after the election. You know, they're, they're, they're put into an investigation, questions by the FBI, and all of a sudden, like Flynn, General Flynn, you know, they're not told uh, in many cases, oh, you could go to jail for this and uh, whatever, and then they wind up charging the guy because he's caught in a lie or he doesn't remember something. It's got nothing to do with tr- with collusion between the president uh, President Trump and, and, uh, and Russia. It's nonsense. It's all politics, and it's extremely destructive politics, and it can cost a lot of people lives. It's got to stop. Now, whether or not she has the smarts or the attention span to do what she's implying here, you know, I mean, it's the one thing to say to the press, well, don't cover the story. But if she's the Speaker of the House and they do, in, in, you know, impeach the president, the media's not going not gonna to say, oh, we're not going to cover the story because Nancy Pelosi don't cover it. They won't cover the story if, if they don't impeach. You know, put the impeachment idea away. It's not right. It's divisive. You know, by the time she gets into power, it's already 2019, and the next year is the next presidential election. Focus mm-hmm. on, uh, you know, winning that election, if that's what you think, if you're a Democrat. I, I absolutely hated Obama. Probably wrote 100 articles against him. There are, there's a special Obama table of contents on my artcode.com website. You know, as I can see, all kinds of horrible things with this guy. He's like he's like the <laughs> negative focal point of history. You know, um, but uh, you know, I, I put up with it. You know, and uh, okay, I wrote articles try to influence how people vote. But that's the name of the game in the United States. When you know, we don't like you don't like what's going on with the system. You, you know, you vote the bums out. You don't you don't uh, do other stuff that. Uh, that are mm-hmm. you know some of the dangers that we're looking at over here. So. That's that's the gist of what was in in the um, in the Civil War article, and uh, all I can say is that uh, you know I, I hope the voters do the right thing. I hope nobody uses the codes. Uh, nobody should ever try to use the codes to support any radical action. Uh, I will tell you this: that uh, you know uh, if you don't know what you're doing statistically. There are all kinds of matrices that people find, and they look significant, and they're absolutely meaningless. Absolutely meaningless. So mm-hmm. uh, because of the frequency of, it, of the terms that they carry, because of the way the words come together in Hebrew, and letter frequencies and so forth. So you really have to know the statistics when you look at something to know whether you're going to, uh, going to accept it. Um, Unless you have a question, I'll go on to the matrix I posted today as a kind of an example. Larry, any questions? Got a question? Well, I was going to mention to Barry that I appreciate him uh, talking about Stephen Kuhn's book, Liberty's Last Stand, because we did a review on that of that book, and I was going to try to get Stephen Kuhn's on as a guest, but uh, he was only in one public setting advertising that book, and I saw it on Lou Dobbs on Fox Business. And then he went underground, and then the book hit, and then suddenly uh, you couldn't find the book anywhere or hear about it hardly. Amazon, you can still find it, but uh, pretty much uh, Stephen Coots had to really go hide out after that book. Incredible Well, book. that doesn't surprise hey, uh, me. I'm sorry <laughs> to hear it. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I, you know, I was shocked when I read it that it got published. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, and it got published during Obama's term. Yeah, I know that. During the election, it was published in 2016. I think it was published yeah, a couple months before the conve- the first convention. So uh, he did not ha- he did not see Trump uh, being nominated in that thing. I guess he probably was reading the newspapers. Uh, they were saying that you know, that was foolish or 
you know, insane that, that uh, President Trump would get elected, but surprise. But the rest of it was, was pretty much spot on. Thank God we have not had martial law declared in this country. It does not mean we won't if there's a civil war that go, occurs, if there's impeachment. I, I think I could I could say without looking at the codes with a very high degree of probability, martial law will be declared uh, because the rioting is unprecedented. You mean if he's impeached? If, if, if President Trump is impeached, um, or uh, well, the question is impeached or impeached and convicted. He's not going to get impe- He's not going to get convicted. I say this in the article over over here. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, I, I kind of emphasize that um, because uh, the fact that you have uh, 53 Republicans, so they they'd have to they'd have to have 60 to 62 people in the Senate. You know that would would come over and vote against President Trump. It ain't gonna happen, not unless something extraordinary came out. And it's not gonna be collusion with Russia. Collusion is not a not a crime anyway. <laughs> so, uh, so it's not gonna happen. So, uh, in terms of would there be rioting if there's just an impeachment? Uh, you know that doesn't have a prayer of going anywhere. And as, as long as people understand this is this is just politics and nonsense. Maybe there wouldn't be a civil war at that point. But if they, if for some reason the Democrats uh, and the Republicans got together in the Senate and wanted to go through an impeachment or, or to, to convict, that would be another matter. Uh, I don't think people would tolerate that unless there was such extraordinary evidence that came out. And frankly, I've only seen evidence once in my life uh, after Watergate, I guess you could say, where there would be clear grounds for impeachment and conviction, uh, and that would be against President Barack Obama for the nuclear accord with Iran, where he gave them $151.7 billion. Mm-hmm. And he gave them a path to a nuclear weapon that would be guaranteed. They could build as many weapons as they want after 10 years. We're down to six and a half years on that clock right now. That's, that's high, tre- high treason. And, and but how the United States did not see that why he was not impeached, I guess it was because coming back to black power, people were afraid that if they did that, there would be a race riot. So that was his literally trump card, you know, on everything. And he played it to the hilt. But that was high treason. And, uh, in fact, I still think, in part based on the codes, uh, there's still a chance that um, you know, certain things come out with President Obama. He could be, he could be brought, brought back and impeached. There's only there is only, there's one case in history, right after the Civil War, where a Supreme Court justice was impeached after he resigned from office. Uh, they put him on trial. Now he was not convicted, but he was impeached, even though he was no longer in office. So I think the same holds true with the president. But again, you get to you get to back to these racial sensitivities. And you have a lot of people in this country uh, that that just see things in terms of black and white. And you know, if if you have accusations of going against the wrong color, um, you know that's uh, intolerable, you know, for them. So uh, you know, it it'd be difficult. But this is where you know the concern for the civil war comes up. The thing for the military uh, that they've got to understand, uh, I'm sure they do, but uh, you know. I, well, let me, let me say this, is that no matter how horrible some, something sounds, we have, and I'm going, to, I'm going to put a we in there as a retired military officer, I was on active duty until I was 60 years old, we have a responsibility plan for everything. So I mm-hmm. once uh, was at a conference in Atlanta, Georgia, um, SAC pause conference it was, and we had, the, what was the conference about? I was the sole representative of the Coast Guard, for planning um, actions in a post-nuclear war environment. And I'm going to tell you something. What I saw there was was not e- – I'm not going to talk about the specifics because it was classified. I'll just say that, you know, in planning for how we would try to put this country on its feet after a nuclear war, it's not business as usual, to say the least. Um, I, wrote, uh, I wrote civil disturbance plans, and I talk about this in the article um, – they were always unclassified, but for official use only. But as a uh, as a, a Coast Guard officer, the only thing that I was concerned about, uh, and what was supposed to be concerned about, in accordance to the guidance that was out there, was if there's a civil disturbance, uh, we have to defend Coast Guard stations. 
Okay, nothing mm-hmm. really <clears throat> horrible about that. <laughs> you know, make sure they don't climb over the chains and take all the property inside, steal the boats and all the stuff like that, just steal the aircraft. And uh, the only other function that we had, as I recall, was to provide transportation for other federal agencies uh, where required, waterborne transportation, because we had the boats. If that would get someplace, maybe assist in firefighting if uh, if we could, that kind of thing. But the every one of those plans that I wrote had as a reference in it the garden plot plan. And the yes. garden plot plan, there is an awful lot of stuff online about it with a lot of conspiracies, and nobody knows what the hell they're talking about. And the reason I say that is the plan was top secret. So unless you had a top secret clearance, you don't know what the hell you're talking about because you haven't read the plan. And that included me, you know, and I had a secret clearance. But here I am, I'm referring to it because I'm saying in the event of a civil disturbance, see, you know, uh, the garden plot, plot and gave a con plan name or, you know, the whole plan name, the number and so forth. But, but uh, it would not be opened up for people to look at until we were in that situation. Right. So, right. Um, you know, these people that speculate, that's all they do, they speculate. And uh, But we have a responsibility, and, and uh, because I've got so many military readers, I'm saying to them, think about these things, here's the situation, and now what are you going to do about it? Because you don't want to shoot from the hip, especially when you've got passions inflamed. On the other hand, uh, do we want to start locking everybody up? In in uh, Liberty's Last Stand, of course, there were these we got concentration camps set up, and uh, President Satoro was having all the uh, the Republicans arrested, all the conservatives arrested and thrown in there, and he was out to execute uh, certain you know certain people, whatever. And uh, and that that brought on the you know the war uh, when people started seeing what was going on. Uh, you know, so martial law is not something you want to just throw out there real fast. So that's uh, in an extreme circumstance you go to go to something like that, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, Anyway, um, uh, this uh, next plan, uh, next uh, matrix I wanted to talk about was just one published today. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's not the most exciting one in the world, but it shows the kinds of things I look for if I want to answer a simple question that's of intelligence interest. And I saw Fort Huachuca come on within a minute uh, of posting this, and they were reading it. Um, by the way, I'm going to just, uh, let me see if I have anything else. Uh, I was going to go back and look and see if they're there now. But uh, at any rate, this one, the general, it was an Iranian general that shot himself in the head, supposedly. And this is what an Iran just announced. His name was General, let me see if I can pronounce his first name here, Gadratola, and then Mansouri. Supposedly shot himself in the head while he was cleaning a gun. Uh, I believe uh, Sunday or, or, or just a, maybe right before Sunday or something like that. Now, when I see something like this, the first, the first thing that comes into my mind is an Iranian general, he's been in battle in Syria. He's been in battle in Iraq. He doesn't know how to handle a gun, and he shoots himself in the head and blows his brains out. Or was he, executed, was he executed by the government of Iran? Was he executed by the Israelis or by the Iraqis or, this, or, the, uh, or by ISIS? Uh, you know, uh, somebody in Syria? Is the, uh, can we trust Iran on this one? So, all right, I got, his, I got an access term here of General Mansouri. It's the only time it occurs in Torah. It's given 58,428. In Raptora. Raptora, by the way, means that the computer had to go through the Torah, the full Torah, more than once. It would go from the uh, from the beginning to the end, and then go back to the first letter in Torah and back to the end again, if necessary. That's a rap matrix. And uh, then then his name pops up uh, this way, and a lot of people they they you know if you're going to find him, uh, there's so many people in the world you got you got to go to Raptora to find out where they are. So on the first line of the matrix at skip at skip one is accident, and that's what the Iranians say it was. And then uh-huh. if I go down the six rows directly under that is the word gun at skip one, and then the two letters that fo- follow that mean dead. So I do find Israel four lines below that, but Israel occurs 591 times in Torah. So. You know, uh, on a matrix this size, which is 666 letters, 
Israel had a uh, 72.5% chance to be there. But the odds against finding accident were 150 at skip one were 153 to one against. So that's a significant term. The odds of finding gun at skip one was 92 to one against. So that's a significant term. So if uh, if I combine them, not counting Israel because I don't have proof that Israel did it. I don't have reason to believe that Israel did it. Uh, he's not at the top of their hit list as far as I know. Um, so the odds for those two words to be at skip one in a matrix that size are 14,086 to one. So when I see this is what the Iranians are claiming in this case, did he accidentally shoot himself in the head? The matrix seems to say yes. Now, a caveat here, um, I went looking to see what else is on the matrix in the uh, open text. And uh, there is the, ter- the phrase from Numbers chapter 16, verse 29. If these men die the common death of all men, of all mankind, then the Lord has not sent me. Now this, uh, and suffer the fate of, uh, here it says, if these men die a natural death and suffer the fate of all mankind, then the Lord has not sent me. So this, um, this particular statement was made by Moses. There was a rebellion against Moses uh, in Sinai by uh, Korah. And he had a couple hundred people who followed him. And uh, at one point, you know, uh, they were arguing with him on a very small point. How small a point? Uh, A Jew wears a prayer shawl, you know, and uh, there are fringes called seat seat on it. Mm -hmm. On each one, in each seat seat, there's supposed to be either white threads, but one's supposed to be a a a certain shade of blue. It's the Tehelis. And so uh, this guy, Korach, was a wise guy. And uh, he said, you know what? Uh, we're all holy. I'm a member of the Levite family and so forth. Uh, I want to have a seat seat that's going to be all blue. Why, why just one? And he argues with Moses. And he wants to lead a rebellion. Just a small point that he's picking. And then Moses says, you know, uh, you know, he falls down and he, uh, like, you don't understand what I, you know, all, everything I've done for you. I was, I, you know, with God's help, I split the sea and, you know, death of the firstborn and you're, you're getting all this manna from heaven and anything else and you want the leadership. You, you're not satisfied with being an assistant. So Moses said that, you know, okay, if you're, if you, these day, you're going to die the, the death of the natural men, then, I'm, then, okay, you're right. God didn't send me. At that moment, mm-hmm. the ground splits open. Yep, and Korach goes down with all his all his family, all his followers into the pit alive, and the ground closes, and that's not the death of all people. So this is this is a very emphatic statement. Now over here, that this statement is on this matrix, it's not a normal thing that a Iranian general would shoot himself in the head. Now maybe if he wanted to commit suicide, okay, but cleaning a gun, it's not a normal. So it's almost like God is saying, okay, well. You're still, you're in the, you're a general of the Revolutionary Guard. You pay terrorist organizations, so maybe I'll make your fingers slip or some whatever. I don't know. Uh, so it's something well, we to look at. Two, but the yeah. okay, we got the about overt two story that okay, the overt story that it was an accident is supported by Torah. All right, I've, I've said more than my piece. I think you got what? What, what else do you want to? How do you want to close out the show, Larry? Got anything? Yeah, I was just going to mention, I know we're almost out of time, but I was going to mention to him that's very interesting, the code he ran on the uh, stupidity virus, it seems to be in prevalent <laughs> around America. <laughs> yes, it is. And that code, uh, there is such a virus, and uh, it's uh, found in, uh, I think it was something like 42% of the uh, people in the sample, and it was found to cause stupidity <laughs> in, uh, I guess, rats or whatever. But it's out there, and it was about the number of people who – about either Democratic <laughs> or Republican. It was a similar type uh, type thing. But, uh, yeah, so I, I, I have a hard time violent. understanding – a very, very hard time understanding how people could vote for a president that, uh, you know, gave uh, that much money to our enemies. Uh, an amazing an amazing thing, and not see it, not, under, not understand what's uh, going on. But uh, yeah, that that article, an alien virus, may po- may explain mass political stupidity. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can see what the name of the virus is in here. I don't know. Skipping through here. There's some number in the beginning, someplace. 
Um, okay, here, I'll, there's a link to the article where I got the thing from. It was Newsweek Magazine. American researchers discover stupidity virus was the uh, where you can find it. Newsweek. The name of the virus was ATCV-1. It's like Alpha Tango, Charlie, uh, Vic, uh, you know, Victor-1. Uh, and, yeah, it was in 43.5% of, uh, of uh, people that were investigated. So it's wow. out there. Well, thanks a lot for coming on, Barry. I guess we're we're running out of time here. I really appreciate, I appreciate you coming it. on. We'll have to have you back. All right, it's always a pleasure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks, Barry. And, uh, both you and Larry, thanks for carrying my stuff. And uh, keep on looking. I saw you sent me some other things to read through and uh, been re- getting ready for the show. Um, you know, since you mentioned the stuff last week, and we'll, I'll, I'll try to check out and see what's there. Okay. Thanks, okay. Barry. Yep. Thanks a lot, Larry. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. And, Google, uh, and Wachuka, that includes you. Have a pleasant evening. Bye. Okay. See you later. <laughs>